So I'm going to uh, call the, the Bastrop City Council to order. We have a quorum present. We have uh, Council Member Gittleland is going to be running late. And Council Member uh, De La Rosa is possibly not going to make it at all, but it's going to try for the second half of this meeting. And I will um, uh, yield to Lisa. Yeah, Leo. Go ahead. Go. I can I can drop the mic. <clears throat> I'm calling the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. I think we have a quorum. A couple people are running late, it looks like, but we're good. Thank you very much. Uh, we're uh, here for a joint workshop session between both our bodies who just opened. Um, I want to uh, say that we're, we're not really supposed to go to board, committee, and commission meeting. That is the city council. Uh, so it's good to be able to say to uh, members from other boards, but especially PNC, who are here tonight, how much we uh, appreciate your work. Uh, we all get paid 75 or $150 a month to do our work here, but y'all have to do it for free. So we uh, very much appreciate, on behalf of all the citizens, what you do. And uh, you're, you're one of the key boards, uh, of course, but we value and respect all the others in the community, 100 or so people that participate in making our government work on a volunteer basis. We. Uh, I want to explain what we're going to do tonight briefly and then turn it over to Mike. We, I'm going to tell it backwards. We had posted some time ago that we would have a workshop on wastewater and water uh, for the city council. I'm glad we have a bunch of folks here. I hope you will stay for the full meeting because there's nothing more critical for the city right now than our uh, water needs, which you know about, but we're talking tonight mostly about wastewater it is becoming equally critical for us. So we had uh, a conversation about some things that were going on uh, on the north side of our community, uh, the area more or less bound by the uh, railroad track, Highway 95, and Piney Creek. We've been giving a lot of attention to that in the last year or so. We uh, have a uh, subdivision that uh, is applied to go in up there. We have been talking about infill for a long time uh, on this council, and I don't we think we've ever grappled with it. We've been talking about traffic impact studies in the infill area of the city, which uh, is hard to understand as opposed to subdivisions in the outlying areas because they're all well planned. But as you know, in, nothing in the old part of town's ever been planned in 183 years. So uh, it was a good opportunity, I thought, for us to come together with our two boards, uh, or our two groups, and we've invited others as well that are impacted by this. For example, the Zoning Board of Adjustment often has to deal with issues that result from a lack of previous planning. So tonight's an opportunity for us to uh, hear from Mike and other staff members to give us all together an opportunity to kind of get a handle on some of the things we face. So uh, first part of this is regarding the, that infill area, and I will turn it over to Mike. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, the first part of our presentation will be regarding infill, um, will be a summary of um, some various studies and reports commissioned by uh, Bastrop Economic Development Corporation uh, Mr. Sean Kilpatrick's here, uh, Executive Director for uh, BEDC, to give a summary of those reports uh, to the Council and Planning Zone Commission. Sean? Andreas is trying to work out our technical difficulties.
my fault. It was working on the other computer. The computer wasn't talking to the projector. Andreas is going to work on that. <laughs> the council and PNZ should all have something that looks similar to this, which is the slide that uh, if we can get them up on the screen for the public, we will. If we need to, we can make additional copies. Uh, but basically, back uh, last year this time, the EDC board authorized Robert Charles Lesser Company, uh, as we refer to them, RCL Co., to go out for, uh, to conduct a housing market demand analysis for Bastrop. Uh, that report came back to us uh, a few months ago, and uh, we have uh, released that to the public. You can go to our website under Community Profile all the way at the bottom housing and you can download the full report as well as the multifamily demand analysis uh, as well um, but what the housing uh, study tells us it basically bre breaks down housing development into three phases uh, the first being between now and the end of, of this decade uh, the first five years uh, in that Bastrop is a attractive place for both young and mature families as well as uh, active adults and looking at market segmentation uh, between 150 and 350,000 in, in price point. Uh, we'll see a little bit later in, in the presentation some of the uh, uh, some of the the, uh, the square footage sizes or lot sizes that, that were recommended in the report. Uh, but looking at about 250 closings annually by the end of this decade, you move out into years five through ten and. Uh, the market segmentation still needs to remain in the market, but closings grow to about 325 annually. And you're looking at uh, the opportunity in attracting possibly uh, some form of active adult community. Within the report, it talks specifically about a highly amenitized active adult community. What we know about the Austin Metro market is, is the community that is filling that need today in that niche in the Austin market will have built out with their final acreage and, and there will be some opportunity for uh, another master plan, highly amenitized development to possibly enter the market. There's a little bit of trend work going on there within home building and within development. Uh, whether or not there's going to be a, a highly amenitized full development for active adults, uh, uh, it will be determined in the next five years. Uh, the trend within active adults is they like being around kids and so you're not seeing the 55 and up age restriction uh, in an entire subdivision. You're seeing it within pods or within sections of the subdivision is, is more the trend today than it was back when that subdivision and, and its brothers and sisters around the country were developed. And so there's a possibility of picking up uh, 300 additional closings in, in active adults. We move out past 10 years and, and the study really tells us is that we're gonna have to continue to have multiple market segments uh, and that there's gonna be a lot of opportunity within the Bastrop market uh, for single family housing. In visiting with Melissa, one of the things that, that we wanted to touch on with PNZ and the city council tonight and, and kind of the public, uh, we went out and ran the numbers this week on home affordability because it's something that a lot of people talk about uh, but probably don't have a good basis and we ran these numbers on best case scenario which basically means you don't have a lot of debt uh, and you're going out using FHA on the top part there and their 31 percent housing ratio which basically means your gross income uh, at 31% is your maximum housing allowable for an FHA loan uh, at a, what we refer to as a 96.5% loan or 3.5% down payment. And so when you look at uh, two $10 an hour jobs at 40 hours a week, uh, looking at $250 in monthly debt uh, because your total cap on that is 43% for total debt against your income uh, ratio, uh, you're looking at a, a monthly payment of about $1,074 and your home affordability is in the low 100s. We also ran that, that same scenario with $500 debt on the Bastrop County median income from 2009 to 2013, and your, your, housing afford, or your monthly housing uh, ratio was $1,300, and your maximum affordability was $113,000. We ran uh, a third scenario of a city of Bastrop police officer and a BIST the teacher, uh, assume they're a married couple uh, or a couple living together, 
We ran them at five years of experience with $1,000 of other monthly debt uh, at that same 3.5% uh, down payment, uh, looking at a monthly ratio of about $2,400. That is actually a point higher uh, at 44% than the allowable under the FHA at $1,000 of other debt. And so that number would actually come down a, a marginal amount. Uh, but if they have any debt above and beyond $1,000, that also affects their maximum affordability. And so these are best case scenarios. You've got a credit, uh, you've got your debt under control. Uh, they come in at 209,000. And what you're looking at is young working professionals that probably have kids or will have kids. They've probably gone to college. They may have college uh, student loans. Uh, that's their maximum affordability under the FHA program. Uh, and so I would anticipate that that number would be the maximum affordability once you ran a real world scenario would be significantly less than 209,000. Once we ran those numbers, we decided that we wanted to back into kind of the higher uh, price point numbers. And so we went out there at 250,000, 350,000, and 500,000, assumed that they had already previously owned a house and that they were gonna have down payment money and equity they pulled out from the previous sale and backed into what their gross annual incomes under a best case scenario with no debt. Uh, and so you're looking at a 250,000 in a best case scenario, needing $74,000 in income, 350 needing 96,000 annual. And if you're gonna go out and buy a half million dollar house with 20% down, you're gonna need about $120,000 in uh, annual income. And that's your maximum qualifying mortgage payment. Uh, and I don't know how your situation is. I don't know how a lot of people's situation is. Uh, but that, that makes you house rich and probably cash flow poor. Uh, and, and so you've got to keep that in mind that uh, and if they, they don't have any other debt or not any significant debt to knock them out of the qualifying ratios uh, on a conventional mortgage uh, through a, a lending institution. So we thought these were interested, no, interesting numbers outside of the home building world, outside of the realtor world. Uh, most people don't run into these calculations until they go to buy a house and they find out how much they can afford. Uh, but this is just a simple chart using some real world examples and then using some uh, uh, home price examples of kind of where you would need to be to be able to, uh, to afford these. The interesting thing is the $250,000 home on the bottom, uh, perfect scenario, 74,000 in income and our annual median income in the county is 51,000. So there's a disconnect between those two numbers that, uh, that we hear a lot of uh, within the community of, of wanting those higher price point houses yet our median income is significantly less than the affordability on them. So then we go to the housing study and we look at the recommendations and strategies, what's called the product matrix. Uh, you'll hear our developers visit about this a lot and where the sweet spot is in, in the market today uh, for demand. And, and those are the green X's uh, in today's. And, and Really, the 100 to 150,000, any developer or builder that's doing any type of production will tell you that's a very difficult price point to reach. Uh, your land costs and development costs are so high. Uh, pricing on a house is really a function of the cost of your lot. Uh, I am a reformed home builder for full disclosure. Uh, typically, when I was a purchasing and estimating manager for a production builder, we were looking at keeping uh, the lot price to 15 to 20% of the hard cost to construct the house. You get outside of that range and you're qualifying and your appraisal uh, of those projects, they, they just fall apart. And so with today's lot prices and, and all of the functions that go into establishing those, uh, being in that sub 150 range is very, very difficult, but it's also a very desirable product in the market uh, on the demand side. The 150 to 200,000, if you go and, and study other markets in Austin, that's really the entry market uh, into uh, buying a, a new home. Uh, you're looking at 50 and 55 foot lots. You're looking at 60 and 65 foot lots. Uh, you're looking at smaller lot sizes, uh, and, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. Number one, it's development cost, and number two, it's demand from the buyers. Uh, those young families, and then also the active adults within the market, the trend within home building is less maintenance and less maintenance means a smaller yard. They'd rather see more open green space and more public park land 
in which they can go enjoy and somebody else maintains. They're able to mow their grass in an hour or two hours on a Sunday and they're not spending four to six hours out there in the Texas heat in the middle of July. We do see some demand in uh, the 60, 65, and 65, 75 range in that 200 to 250 price point. There's a little bit of demand out there in today's market for 250 to 300. When we look at Pecan Park uh, and, and what's going on there, they're gonna fall in the bottom right-hand part of that quadrant uh, in, in that 200 to 300, 350,000 price point is, is where they're going to be today. They've got some future product out there that, that may be at, at some of the lower price points, but today they're at the bottom right-hand part of that quadrant. What we're lacking within the market is that 150 to, to 250,000, uh, but we've gotta have market segmentation and, and, and various market products uh, because what we found in the study of, of the market is uh, not all buyers are alike and they don't all like the same product. And so what may attract them to Vastrop, they may come out and find that in one subdivision that attracted them here, it's not the product that they want and they want other options within, within the community. And so it, it's the general uh, feeling of the EDC that, you know, we need to have somewhere between four to five active developments uh, in Bastrop that are, that are providing single family housing and probably six to seven to eight uh, active builders in the market by the end of the decade, first part of the next decade, uh, providing product across all these price points and have market segmentation because that's what's going to attract uh, buyers into this market. We were, uh, it, you may or may not have seen uh, the news release today uh, we gave a presentation to my board last week uh, or two weeks ago on West Bastrop development. Uh, we gave a little bit of that belief uh, um, to some other boards and commissions. I get asked to speak about two to three times a week, so they run together. Um, one of our big fears is, is the 71-130 uh, corridor. There was an announcement uh, within the last 24 hours that Austin Community College has acquired 124 acres to develop a campus there right off of 71 near the 130 corridor. That provides some concern for us uh, long term in, in some of the development that's going to be going on because that will be uh, a catalyst project in that region and now we're going to be on the 71 corridor east of the airport. Uh, there's going to be some development in that area that we're going to be competing for now that we traditionally have not competed for. The multifamily demand analysis uh, was conducted by Capital Market Research and Charles Highsmith. He's the preeminent uh, researcher in Austin on multifamily uh, demand analysis, very well respected, uh, does a lot of work for the Austin Apartment Association, does a lot of work uh, for banks and finance institutions doing market demand analysis on specific projects. Uh, but what we found is, is kind of interesting that uh, between now and the end of the decade, we can absorb 175 to 225 units annually. Generally, when we speak in public, 900 to 1,000 units by the end of the decade. We've met uh, with uh, almost double-digit developers looking at this market. Currently within Bastrop, there are two planned developments uh, that are zoned correctly with allocations for multifamily. Outside of that, there would need to be rezoning done on a new development or an existing development to plan development with a multifamily uh, allocation within it. There is a couple, there is a track uh, outside the city limits uh, that's going to be located in a municipal utility district uh, that has the potential to come online as part of, of that development. Uh, so what that tells you is, is between our two lots that are our two sites that are zoned plan development and the one outside, that's probably somewhere between six and 700 units and we're still four to 400 or so, 300 units short by the end of the decade. Um, there is a lot of demand out there in the market. 7% um, of our tenants uh, reside in buildings with uh, 10 or more units. The Austin MSA, that average is nearly 50%. So within our market, uh, what Charles considers market rate of comp apartment complexes, uh, there's six of them with 604 units. They're running about 98% occupancy. I can tell you at two of the three complexes that, that we track in our office, they have waiting lists until late December, early January for move-ins. Uh, the, the third one, as they have openings, they're able to fill them relatively quickly. Two-thirds of our renters live in single-family dwellings, which is, a, uh, uh, is significantly higher than, than most metro markets, and, and we're and higher than, than probably what Bastrop should be because we're not offering enough multifamily tenants. 
one of the, the misconceptions that we hear a lot uh, in our office is they multifamily market rate apartment complexes, uh, their occupancy levels. So, in, and typically in the Austin market, there's about 2.58, 2.6 residents per unit. A single family house in the Austin market is about 3.6. So there's actually one more uh, occupant in a single family house than there is in a market rate apartment complex. Uh, we also hear that it's a drain on our school system. Well, the reality is that the new 200 unit apartment complex is gonna be somewhere in the 16 to $20 million range. It's gonna be appraised on the income approach versus the comparative sale approach. Uh, and I'm pretty darn sure adding 12, 14, $16 million to the school district's appraisal roles is a benefit to them. Uh, and so market rate apartment complexes, uh, when done correctly, um, uh, will provide us housing for those brackets that can't afford the single family house. That's my tie in back to the chart earlier, by the way. That those guys that are not ready to come out into the market uh, early in their careers can't buy $150,000, $160,000 house. It gives them the opportunity as a young family to go ahead and move to Bastrop, settle their roots here, and as they move through their life cycle, uh, be part of our community. Uh, there's a lot of demand here. We, we face some challenges in uh, sites. Uh, a couple of the sites need, uh, need some infrastructure extended to them, to the, the boundaries of, of the, the, the site uh, that, that we're all gonna have to look at and go, how can we help make these sites buildable today because the demands in the market uh, uh, to, to be able to get them built and to uh, get them occupied. That is my presentation and I think I stayed under 10 minutes. Now, I asked for 30 and I got 10. <laughs> These are things that are in the market that there's demand uh, both from on the developer side and the buyer side. So uh, if, if the city was, was, was willing to undertake them and encourage them, the developers would come and within the market, the residents, the, the renters and the buyers are out there and, and are willing to be here. Uh, That's good you're talking about if you're concerned about we, we would be in competition with one second development on 781. And I see from a point of zoning Our concern with the 71 and 130, and it's part of our West Bastrop Village, uh, or West, ba West, West Bastrop Development conversation, uh, our retail trade area goes to 130 today. Uh, with the ACC campus announcement, what I told the, my board was we probably had a three to five year window before any development in that area really had any significant effect on Bastrop's retail trade area, which is our primary sales tax, our primary uh, uh, revenue source for the city of Bastrop. With that development, that'll be a catalyst project that actually will create student housing around there, create retail development around there. And our retail trade line that's at 130, our consultant in that business, as well as staff agree that it's gonna pull back somewhere this side of Cedar Creek, gonna cut off of our 180,000 in our shopping territory, the best estimate that we had a third to a quarter of our uh, shoppers that come to Bastrop today, uh, which is probably the greatest uh, risk we have in our revenue sources of sales tax today outside of the economy having some type of fluctuation in so if we don't grow in core bastrop the challenges that we face externally from growth in another region are going to affect the resources and the finances ultimately uh, of the community which if we don't get out in front of it in the next three years and continue to get out in front of it uh, there's devastating financial uh, consequences as, as we lose shoppers that are gonna be going into that 7130 130 corridor versus coming to Bastrop that traditionally have come here. So what we're seeing there, online sales don't worry us as much. So basically sales tax is paid to the nine digit zip code. 
So if you order something online and you have it delivered to your house in Bastrop, Texas, for most online retail sales, uh, the sales tax is collected at the company level and it's remitted to the comptroller to the nine digit level and it gets back to Bastrop. Now it does affect local sales and local employment for those. What we're seeing in, in that business is a trend to move to, especially in the mid tier retailers, to stores that are more return centers. They're going with smaller footprint stores in which you can, if you don't find it in a store, they can order it for you or you can order it online, you get it to your house, you decide it doesn't fit and you're able to return it within your community and they have the opportunity to recapture that sale from you. And so within retail, you're seeing more integration between online sales and retail in store sales. Uh, it's not as big a concern as it used to be when sales tax wasn't collected online uh, as, as readily as it is today. And so as long as you're, they're getting your nine digit zip code and they're remitting that sales tax, we're still collecting it even though it's not inside the store here in Bastrop. So that doesn't concern us as much as it used to. It is still always a concern for those retailers that don't have a physical presence in Texas because if you have a physical presence in Texas, you have to collect that nine, at the nine digit zip code level and remit those sales tax. Well, what we're seeing is in siding of new retail stores, you're seeing the numbers that they're requiring for their population base, the, their density, you're seeing those numbers go up. Uh, you're seeing uh, casual dining restaurants um, in the class that we would be working on attracting. Those numbers are 25 to 50,000, moving up to 35,000 to 50,000. And so we're gonna see those numbers continue to increase. And we're typically talking about a five mile radius around Bastrop, not in the city limits. Uh, you're going to see those numbers increase because they're going to be looking for increased density. And it, it doesn't matter if it's a casual dining restaurant or if it's a brick and mortar store. <coughs> they're going to want more density within their trade area to be able to justify that. One of the interesting ones is, is always a movie theater. They're, the typical rule of thumb on a movie theater is you're looking for 10,000 residents per screen. Uh, and if you can justify 10,000 residents per screen and you can make the model work uh, with the number of that you need to cash flow and to, to be profitable, it's a good deal. If you can't do that, then, then you're gonna struggle. Any other questions? I'm always willing to come back. Thank y'all. Um, I think y'all know who I am. The mayor gave me seven minutes, so I've gotta kick it into <laughs> high Yankee gear here and uh, get through this. But uh, uh, the mayor asked me to touch on a, a few components um, regarding uh, infill development and, and what it means to a, to a city. And I'm going to start the presentation out with, and we'll get this put into a, a presentation map, but all these yellow spots that you see here are uh, spots that people have come in at one time or another to the city to potentially see about developing. Now, some are bigger than others. Some may have only put would want to put four houses on, some may want to put more, um, and even some of these yellow spots are actually platted subdivisions that were never put in. So that creates another set of problems that will have to be dealt with because they were platted but they weren't required to provide the, the proper fiscal posting and they are legally recorded lot. So as you can see, there's, there's quite a lot of potential there within the inner core of the city. Um, why is infill development important? Well, I'm giving it strictly from a city's viewpoint. It's a problem because vacant lots, dilapidated houses, large areas are, are a place where weeds and rubbish accumulate. Um, they are in constant need of cleanup and perpetual maintenance. And normally the people surrounding them contact the city requesting that they be mowed, that the junk and debris be picked up and um, we do try to get in touch with the property owners, but most generally uh, the property owners live in another state and filing a complaint in municipal court is nothing less uh, of importance to them, so we end up having to uh, handle that problem. Um, lots that are targeted for demolitions, especially uh, where we have substandard structure um, to be demolished, we get complaints from citizens living next to those 
types of houses, of kids get gathering there in the evening or after school, and if left on address, it will lead to creeping the inner center decay to an unacceptable appearance for the community, and I don't think that's where anybody wants Bastrop to go, especially if we're known as uh, a historic city. Um, why is it important? Uh, one, it helps improve the efficiency of the existing infrastructure. Uh, in many cases in this area, uh, the city has replaced uh, old deteriorated infrastructure um, and it allows us to uh, utilize that. Um, it will broaden your tax base for all the taxing entities. Um, it will help uh, initiate and enhance efforts to replace and restore existing deteriorating housing stock. And also, uh, it will relieve what we've seen, housing development pressures in unincorporated areas having limited development uh, controls, lack of adequate infrastructure and services. And you've seen those areas way out in the county where they just come up overnight and then you're stuck with having to deal with them. And who benefits from the infill development? Your taxing entities, because most generally, all of these, many of these spots are not paying taxes. They got back taxes, and then they go to someone buys them for a tax sale, then they sit there, and it's just a repetitive cycle. Your utility providers benefit um, all of them because they all have the infrastructure usually going in those areas, serving existing uh, residential homes and businesses. Um, it creates opportunities for homeowners and renters, and you've heard Sean speak of the need for that. Uh, the real estate, construction, and lending interests all have a benefit from this, and by improving the appearance of your community, the community as a whole benefits. And that's my seven minutes. I told the mayor I'd keep it to seven minutes. take all the two minutes, but the question I had, the problem we had there was primarily getting in and out of the place. The only way to get out of there was to come downtown. And I think that leads to our, our next topic. That's the next, okay. That's, 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 that's the first that we do. I was just great. Thank you. Honor of introducing um, 
appreciate you everybody. Uh, I'd like to introduce this. Is, yes, you haven't lost your voice. Okay. Uh, I'd like to introduce, this is Trey Gamble. He is a traffic engineer with Alliance Transportation Group, and they are the firm that's helping us prepare our master transportation plan that's part of our comprehensive plan process. And he was uh, uh, kind enough to come in to uh, talk about traffic impact analyses and, and what we can expect out of those and, and what kind of benefit we gain from, from acquiring them. I'm going to talk a little while. have handouts of this. If anybody doesn't have a copy, I'll be glad to pass one out. <laughs> we have lots of copies, actually. <clears throat> um, as Wesley mentioned, we are, uh, our firm is doing your transportation plan, um, and I was asked to speak somewhat to the, to the role of the traffic impact analysis um, and what it is and what it isn't. Um, the first thing that a traffic impact analysis isn't is it is not a transportation plan. <clears throat> the, two, um, the two go work together uh, to help you shape your community and help you achieve what your goals are. Um, but the, the, the plan is much more regional in nature, much more long term in nature. It gives you the big vision. Um, the, Traffic impact analysis helps you deal with individual developments, specific intersection uh, improvements, other transportation needs. Um, it's basically intended to help you identify uh, the need for improvements uh, to the transportation system uh, in, in the vicinity of and adjacent to your, your uh, whatever development you're considering. Um, and it's geared towards maintaining a satisfactory level of service, um, an acceptable level of safety if you have uh, intersections or facilities where you're um, experiencing a high number of crashes, can help you identify some of those and, and identify uh, ways to, to mitigate those. Um, and it's also to address whether or not the access provisions for the proposed development are adequate or appropriate. Level of service, uh, this, this one is, this slide is in here by request. Um, this is one that was included in, was a public involvement uh, that, that uh, we did as part of the transportation planning process. Um, but it illustrates, uh, when we talk in terms of level of service, um, this is what we're referring to. It's a, it's a grading scale that, uh, that addresses uh, traffic congestion uh, and mobility in the area. Um, level of service A, B, C, and D are typically uh, considered acceptable. Uh, sometimes if you're on the receiving end of D and on the, the lower end of it, you might not consider it acceptable, but for the purposes of the traffic analysis and evaluating the impacts, level of service D is, is typically considered acceptable. Uh, level of service E and level of service F are not considered acceptable. So when we're evaluating the impacts from a new development, um, we look at those levels of service, and if it's in the unacceptable range, then we start looking for ways to uh, mitigate those impacts uh, through signalization, if it's an unsignalized intersection, through or through lesser levels of control, uh, roundabouts, uh, Geometric improvements, such as the addition of turn lanes, um, if you're if you're looking at a uh, at a at the, a corridor facility, you may be looking at going from a two-lane facility to a four-lane facility. Uh, but that's what we're looking at in terms of level of service, where we where we where the analysis shows that it's unacceptable. We start looking for ways to get it back to an acceptable level. The TIA is um, the, the process and the, uh, 
the conditions under which the analysis is performed is scoped in consultation with the city staff. And uh, with regard to your codes and policies, uh, city staff uh, takes a look at the size of the development, what, what the land uses are going to be, um, how much traffic is going to be um, generated by the, the development, and that's used to determine the appropriate, an appropriate study area. Um, a small uh, fast food restaurant is not going to generate impacts um, at, a, at, at a greater distance um, as a, uh, a large development. Uh, Pecan Park was mentioned earlier. Very large development, multi-use, uh, residential, commercial, a lot of a uh, lot of trips being generated by that development. That's going to that's going to result in a much larger study area that needs to be evaluated. Whereas a fast food restaurant or a corner uh, corner convenience store um, may only need to to look in terms of one or two intersections away from that <coughs> away from that development. Um, other things that are taken into consideration in uh, in performing the traffic impact analysis. Uh, and, and going into the scope, uh, what other developments are in the area? Um, it, infill has been mentioned. So, uh, you know, you're, you're, you have a situation where you have existing residential, you have some infill locations, um, you have, you know, several infill locations. If two or three of those have, uh, have development that's being planned or being discussed with the city, then uh, if, if if I were responsible for doing a TIA at one of those locations and there was another one two or three blocks away, um, I would need to take into account that other development that's not constructed yet, but in order to evaluate the impacts, we need to look at the trips that are being generated, not just by the existing development and the proposed development that we would be analyzing, but also by other developments that are being planned or have already been approved. Um, it, it would include existing intersections uh, in the event that there are uh, transit facilities, multimodal facilities. Those would need to be taken into consideration. What would the impact be? How much of the, uh, the travel could be offset by uh, using transit uh, services? Uh, it takes into account committed and planned roadway improvements. This is where your, the, uh, the transportation plan and the TIA overlap. Uh, part of your transportation plan is taking a long a look into the future, kind of a long distance look and saying, this is where we think we're gonna need a corridor to serve future traffic. Um, number one, have, is, it, is it just a line on a piece of paper that is something that's into the future or is it something that's more near term that you have already identified, you have plans in the works, you have funding identified for it and that would be a committed project. Those projects that are planned or committed but not yet constructed, the TI also takes those into consideration. Um, what, what are the impacts of the new development uh, going to have on those planned facilities? How do they help to alleviate the, the demands from the new project? Um, the growth rates. Uh, growth rates can, can have a dramatic impact on the, uh, on the scope of the TIA on the analysis. Uh, if you're in an area of town that is um, that is not exhibiting a high growth rate, then you don't want to overestimate what that future traffic is gonna be uh, due to the, to the background traffic. And typically, the more developed as you start to, as you start to see um, an area become built out, those growth rates are more a function of traffic that's passing through the area rather than development that's going to be occurring within that area. Um, future analysis here. Um, is it some, is the development plan for completion a year from now, two years from now? Is it a multi-phase development that's going to take place over the next 5, 10, 15 years? Um, that works with your growth rate to determine what that future background traffic that's not associated with the development is going to look like. And then neighborhood sensitivities. Um, is the development occurring in an area where it's going to have impact <coughs> on existing neighborhoods? Is it in a new area that's essentially undeveloped where there aren't any impacts to existing um, existing neighborhoods or, or facilities. Again, back to your to your issue related to infill development. This is difficult to read on the screen. There is, a, and it's probably difficult to read in the two per page, 
Um, there is a larger one, but this is the process, the, the elements that are uh, involved in the TIA process. Uh, it begins with a development plan uh, that the develop that the uh, property owner developer has put together of what they want to do with that property. Uh, the, it takes into consideration the area land uses, area uh, transportation systems, uh, the, her the development uses, the things that, that we many of the things we uh, mentioned previously, uh, the existing site, uh, the existing trips, uh, traffic generation. Um, site trips that are generated by the new site takes into account your, your plan and what are your design criteria for your roadway systems. Um, it, it basically goes through the process from the development phase all the way down to the review and permitting phase. And it's a, uh, it, it basically defines or, or outlines what the different steps are and what the different phases are that the traffic impact analysis and the evaluation go through um, in, in the process of getting from the development to having uh, actually uh, approved and uh, approvals and permits in place. Context and framework for the TIA essentially is looking, starting from existing conditions to set a baseline. Um, what are the highest traffic hour, uh, hours of traffic, peak hours, usually a, a two hour period in the AM is going to contain, uh, include uh, traffic, uh, especially in a residential area, people that are leaving to work in the mornings, then in the afternoons, uh, as they're coming back home, you, you'll see very dramatic peaks uh, of your traffic patterns in the morning and in the afternoon. Uh, some types of developments will have uh, existing condition traffic that, that needs to be taken into consideration that may not fall into the commuter type peak traffic if you have schools in an area that, that dismiss uh, earlier in the afternoon than when people are coming home, that's something that would need to be taken into consideration in the uh, traffic impact analysis. Um, background study here, what, what is the current state of the roadway system, the intersections, uh, and the traffic in the area? And then the TIA is going to look at future conditions. Uh, again, what are the horizon years? Is it a two-year uh, construction timeline or is it five years for phase one, another five years for phase two, and then ultimate build out in 15 years? Um, what are the anticipated or planned offsite changes? Again, those are your committed or planned improvements to your roadway system that are coming out of your transportation plan. Um, the non-site traffic, that's the background development and the pass-through traffic or growth, normal growth that's going to occur in the area conditions and then your site traffic. How is that site traffic that's directly related to the development going to impact your traffic conditions? This graphic again a little bit hard to read up here um, but this is a little different from the, from the uh, previous one. This is what is actually involved in doing the site impact analysis. Um, so again it starts with the development plan goes through the methodology uh, and the scope that have been uh, developed in coordination with the city staff. But it goes through an iterative process that identifies the existing conditions uh, and establishes baselines and then goes through an iterative process for the future conditions. Um, that level of service again is the key. So if you, for, for um, existing conditions, acceptable level of service, it's an iterative process of looking at what improvements are needed to address those issues and get the level of service back to an acceptable level. Uh, the, the mitigation, uh, again, is, a, uh, is part of the uh, collaboration with the city, between the developer and the city. Uh, in some cases, the city may have specific uh, preferences over uh, over what should be improved, what, what uh, priority uh, improvement should take. Um, the developers typically are more concerned, developments are concerned with what is my fair share of what those improvements need to be. Uh, so in some cases, the developer's percentage may be 
their impacts may, may be 10% of the cost of making the needed improvements at an intersection. Um, and they may have, they may have percentages at five or six different intersections, but none of them are 100% uh, the responsibility of the developer. They're not 100% attributed to the site development. Um, so they're just saying, well, you know, write a check for this amount, and then it just sits there. Uh, those improvements don't get made uh, because the funds aren't available for the additional percentages or other developments aren't uh, in play yet that would be contributing to that. So there's, there's, a, uh, there's a back and forth process there between the developments and the city trying to establish what, what's appropriate. Is there something we can do? Uh, and and that is a, uh, that's something that varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, as an example, the city of Austin, uh, for many, many years, has just said, what's your percentage? Write us a check. We're going to put it into an account over here. And when we get enough money to go with it to make those improvements, we'll make those improvements. The uh, city of Austin is now beginning to reevaluate that because the money's just sitting in an account. They can't get enough to go with it. There's no benefit to having that money sit there. Um, so they're beginning to reconsider, perhaps, if a signal is needed at intersection A, and that signal is going to cost $200,000, and the developer has percentages at all of these other locations, but their total participation uh, in, in impact is $200,000. Maybe it's better to take that money and get that signal put in so that there's some benefit from coming from, the, uh, from that contribution uh, that's not it's not just sitting there in an account. Uh, there's benefit to the development because they get the traffic into and out of their development. There's benefit to the city because there's an improvement that is needed that has been made. Uh, but again, that's, that, that is what turns the TIA into a, a, uh, a tool and a process for achieving your goals that you have set out in your, uh, in your transportation plan. Um, again, the traffic analysis, things we consider are existing conditions and the land uses. Is it in a residential area uh, or is the, the area residential or non-residential? Uh, the traffic in that area, is it local or is it pass-through traffic? That, in, that, that becomes important when you start talking about the growth rate. Uh, you have a lot of pass-through traffic on 71, but that's not anything that is going to be something that a developer can or that a development uh, would necessarily have an impact on. Those are, those are uh, developments and that's growth that's occurring outside your area, but it's still passing through your area. You're, you're, you are having some impacts from it, but nothing that you necessarily have a lot of control over. Um, in the future conditions, again, the horizon years, background traffic, growth and other developments. Um, for the site traffic, we typically use uh, the Institute of Transportation Engineers Drip Generation Manual, which is three very thick volumes that has all different types of land uses in it. Um, on more common uses, uh, it's a very good resource. Uh, you may, if you have any specific uses that are not well documented in the IT, it may require a specific study done on similar developments in your area. Uh, gymnastics is a good example. We've, recently done a, uh, a traffic impact analysis in an area where a uh, gymnastics facility was going to be part of the development. IT doesn't have good information for gymnastics. So in working with the, with the city and that, with that jurisdiction, um, we said, well, they've got another facility over here. We'll go and observe that facility, collect traffic data at that facility, and then we'll apply it here. So again, it's a, uh, it's a collaboration between the developer and the city to determine what is appropriate in terms of the trips and in terms of the development. Uh, trip distribution, residential and non-residential trips have very different distributions. In a residential area, most of your trips are leaving in the morning, coming back in the evenings. Uh, for retail development, in a lot of cases, there's very little traffic in the mornings, but you have uh, <coughs> traffic coming to and from that development in the afternoons as people are getting out, they're shopping on their way home, they're going to shopping. Um, so trip distribution 
if you have a mixed use development, is actually kind of a two part process. You look at the residential distribution, you look at the non residential distribution. Uh, again, that's very site specific um, in terms of the transportation plan. The transportation plan doesn't get that specific in looking at true distribution. Uh, it, it's done with the travel demand model and it looks at more regional uh, impacts of traffic, more regional distributions of traffic flow in and out of the area and internally within the area, but not at the intersection, not at the site level. So that's where the, the traffic impact analysis again comes in and, and provides a tool for looking at where those improvements need to be made to get some benefit. Uh, trip assignment is, is related to the trip distribution. Um, what paths are, the, are those trips that are going to and from the site? What roads are they taking? Uh, what are the potential impacts on those roads and through those intersections? Uh, again, the, the, you start looking at infill development. You have established communities. You have established roads, established neighborhoods. Uh, it's not necessarily likely that you're going to want to go in and start widening uh, your local streets, so you need to look at the trip, assi uh, trip assignment to the development, what are the impacts on those roadways, and what is, is the appropriate mitigation. Um, in some cases, the, the appropriate mitigation may be that uh, there's an agreement made with the developer that the land use that they want to put in at that location is not as intense and doesn't generate as many trips. Um, so it's not always a question of, can we build more at the intersection? Can we widen the roads? Uh, can we put a signal in? In some cases, the right answer may be, let's not develop quite the, the density that was originally planned. Let's minimize the number of trips. It's more the, let, let's make improvements on the demand side, not on the supply side. I wasn't uh, entirely certain what questions might come up. I may or may not have Addressed any issues or any questions? I, I would ask a question, and I think that might help for the for my peers on the planning zone. Um, the general residential street, one lane each direction, and I guess you know, with parking allowed or parking not allowed. What's <coughs> that level of service? What kind of volume? And I know there's lots of parameters, but you know we could ask that. So, what kind of volume has an acceptable? Correct. It depends. Um, in in a lot of cases, right. okay. uh, five hundred vehicles a day, you know, give or take. It depends. Is it a cul-de-sac? Is it a through facility? Is there is a um, is it a 19, 20 foot right of way, or is it a larger collector uh, facility? All of those enter into it. Are there other um, are there other parallel facilities in it? Or is, the, is it in the neighborhood that's on a grid structure or a grid, grid layout? Or is it in an area where um, this is the, the road that serves other local roads and kind of lines around? Um, so there are things you can do to accommodate higher traffic volumes, but you don't want, you don't want high volumes on a narrow street. You want to keep those lines. You want, it's what we refer to as uh, the hierarchical, hierarchical function, functional classification. Your local streets, your very narrow streets, are intended to serve those properties and provide access to those properties, not to provide access through that part of the neighborhood. But then those local streets feed to a collector. They feed to a collector. The collectors are going larger, wider cross section. They have more capacity. Uh, the intersections where those intersect with other collectors have a, a different design also to, to accommodate the higher traffic volumes and allow more capacity. And then for every lot, what's the, what's the ITE generation for a residential home that has um, It depends on household size, household income. Typically you're looking at around 10 trips per household. So, uh, but again, the, in dealing with the, your transportation plan and the travel demand model, that becomes very, uh, very dependent on your demographics. And, your, uh, and again, I'm getting off the topic of the traffic impact analysis, but this kind of addresses your question of how many trips are generated by 
a particular type of household. Is it a uh, household with a, a, a median income of $250,000, three kids, two cars, um, you know, or is it a, uh, a lower median income, one family member, one person living in a household? So it's, it's very dependent on the demographics of the households. That varies by the different areas within the city and what's projected to be in the undeveloped areas. Um, if you, if you, if you expect your analysis, like, if you, you saw what Sean's presented to us, so if, when there's an infill development, they have a target price that they're trying right. to sell, and, that, and then you can go right back to it, and that, I would assume that's what you would use. In, in that sense, what we do for the traffic impact analysis is not as sensitive. The ITE uh, trip generation is not as sensitive to the median household income, the household size, the lot size, uh, we deal more with just the number of units. Uh, so the number of single family residential lots, uh, the number of multifamily lots, is it a condominium? There's different land uses for those different um, types of developments, but not anything that gets to the level that the travel demand model does in trying to look at regional trip generation where it looks at income, household size, vehicles available, um, and those different parameters because it's dealing on a much larger and a more generalized in a lot of cases. I mean, that, I know that sounds more specific, but in a lot of ways it's more generalized uh, because you're, you're having to um, take into account not just how many trips are being generated, but the types of trips and where they're going to be traveling to. Um, the travel demand model takes into account uh, how many of those trips that are generated by that household, how many of them are work-related trips, how many of them are non-work-related trips. Um, for example, school, shopping, uh, there's a lot of different trip categories that get broken up in the travel demand model in looking at those different uh, household and income demographics that are not taken into consideration in the traffic impact analysis. Yes, sir. How many questions raise this rate in my opinion on the biggest problem we have in planning and zoning division? That is, we don't see a traffic impact analysis until the project is way down the road as practical. Uh, the car park would get to see the traffic impact analysis. Uh, is there any way to do a preliminary look to see whether someone like you thinks this development is likely to generate a traffic issue? The mechanism that's in place within the city to do that is the traffic impact analysis. Um, and I, I'll defer to your staff with regard to, uh, to whether or not they have the latitude to say, you know, we really don't want to wait until, until this part of the process. We think this one needs to have a TIA as part of the zoning process. Do you all have the, 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 uh, the latitude to, to make that requirement part of, uh, part of the zoning process? We, we, we can't require it technically until the preliminary class. Okay. Is that, is, that, is that because of our rules or is that the standard? That's what our ordinance says. That's, that's what our ordinance says. But I would also say sometimes at the zoning process, the developer doesn't necessarily have the idea of, of the number of units right. or what traffic um, proposed generation will be at that. Right. And, and in a lot of cases, they're not at that level to know I'm going to have this many option units. They just know I want some residential, I want some commercial, I want about this many acres of commercial, this many acres of residential. But depending on what they decide to do for residential, single family detached has a very different density than uh, the multifamily, obviously. So just saying this many acres of residential still doesn't necessarily get you a number where you can say it's going to generate this much traffic. And in some cases, if the zoning is already, uh, if there's not a zoning change, then it's, it moves straight into the next, the next phase. Um, there is one of the things that I think we've, we've had some discussion, I know I've had discussions with, um, with Wesley about, there are some tools out there that would enable um, the staff to look at 
in, in general terms, not necessarily uh, a development specific issue, but to be able to look at, uh, at kind of the overall uh, development in the area and say, you know, if, if we end up, if development goes in in this area um, and it generates, we think it's going to generate this many trips, what impacts are those going to have on these intersections? Um, I've, I've shown Wesley one of the tools that we use that is um, that's very useful for that type of analysis. And it's not, uh, the travel demand models that we use for the transportation plan <coughs> require quite a bit of expertise because they have to be um, they have to be calibrated, they have to be validated, they have to be tweaked a certain way or they don't give you good results. Um, this other tool is uh, kind of a bridge between the travel demand model and the actual intersection analysis. Uh, for example, we, we typically use a program called Synchro to do the intersection level analysis. Um, this, this other tool that I'm talking about allows you to create a network of the major roads for your area um, and to load traffic onto those roads and route it through the intersection so you can see what, uh, and, and it's a manual process, so it doesn't automatically distribute the, the trips on the, uh, on the network uh, as the travel demand model does. So there's, there is a level of manual uh, data uh, manipulation that, that has to be done as far as uh, making a judgment call on what percentage of the trips are going to use this road, what percentage are going to use this road. But when it gets to the intersection level, it allows you to look at those operational levels of service and get a feel for, you know, if we, if we end up with 10,000 trips uh, coming out of this area, we're going to end up with problems at this intersection. We need to start looking at that ahead of time. We need to be aware of that. Uh, and that's independent of the develop of a specific development that might be going in. So, so the analysis doesn't kill a project, it talks about concessions that needs to be made. Is that correct? Um, the TIA is where you get into the project level. I'm talking about something a little bit broader in scope um, that is not project specific. It wouldn't, um, it wouldn't say, you know, no, we're going to kill this project. Um, what it identifies are uh, Areas where, as they develop, you, you would anticipate that if they develop at a higher density, you will begin to see issues at some of these locations. So you need to make sure that, as the traffic impact analyses are being done, that they recognize that they take those uh, those intersections and those facilities into account in the scope for those for those traffic impact analyses. It's a, it's it. It's more of a planning tool than an analysis tool uh, at that level. Uh, it can also be used for analysis, but when you start getting to the analysis level, that's where you are looking at project specific. Uh, at, the, at the level that I'm talking about, I'm talking about more of a general planning tool to, to be able to see what may be coming down the road before development starting. to me. 
maintained doesn't require somebody to, to have, uh, when, we, when we hire uh, the staff that we have that, that run the travel event models, they've, they've got, uh, you know, they, they've gone to training, they've, there's been a lot of you know, on-the-job training and experience that goes into learning how to develop and run those models. This is, um, this is a tool that is very user-friendly. Um, if you understand how, you know, how to, 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 draw the, to draw lines on a map, to put your roads in, and how to tell the intersection, I've got two through lanes and a left turn lane and a right turn lane in this direction. And it's all very, very user-friendly, very uh, graphically driven. You pick what you want out of the drop downs on the screen and it builds the intersection configuration for you. So it's very easy to use, but it's a very powerful tool if you if you apply it the right way. Yeah, Lisa, I wanted to say something. Y'all raised a, a specific question to a general thing that I hope, I, I know, I'm only speaking for myself on the council, but I hope that our boards, and particularly your board, will think about tools that you need and tools that the city needs, whether it's a, a revised ordinance or our staff having equipment or uh, software or whatever it is to do certain things that would help you, that I, I for one, would be very welcoming of, of hearing that from you. I would love to see you all be more proactive in terms of what you think we need. Then we can work with Mike to work with the staff and see if we can get somewhere. But, but this is a good example of something that I've felt for a long time. And I know we mostly present you with agendas that say, hey, respond to this. But you can certainly generate your own agendas. And I, for one, uh, is, am encouraging you and every other board in this uh, city to do that. Also, while I've got the mic, I just want to say that one of the things that, um, that we've not done, and this is going to follow up on this, we have, we've started, we've talked a long time about infill. And Mike and his staff, I think, are starting to work on that. But we, we haven't done a very good planning uh, the job of planning as well as we should have. And those yellow areas are almost all in the north area of town that I talked about. And uh, I'm expecting to see the old form-based code that's had a couple of new people added to it use its creative juices to not talk about form-based code exactly in the north area, but to take our next kind of troublesome area that's never got planned, just like the area they just finished up with, and to see them come up with some creative ideas about how we can use that area to, to be a better part of our community following the, the lines that Mike was talking about and I hope other things that none of us have ever thought about. It's a very creative group. They all said they were willing to continue. Uh, I don't know how it got derailed and it's slow moving, but I understand from Mike that it's going to be having a meeting sometime in January and I expect to see them you know, moving right along and doing some some good work for us in that area of town because there's nothing tonight that impresses me more than we should have been doing that a long time ago. Well, and I'll just speaking on behalf, I think, of the PNC Commission, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that you're open to allowing PNC to come up with some recommendations for tools, whether it's software or ordinance changes. And we might take this up after the first year, but I'm here. I'm, I'm interested to see if P and Z would be willing to workshop and come up with a list of proposed items that we think might help. Because we're we're starting to feel the pinch of growing things. We're, we're seeing, that, you know, we have one rather large infill development that's really kind of poked in front of us, and we're we're kind of hemmed in in the solutions that we have at right at the moment to really kind of shape what we'd like to see there. So I. I'd like to see maybe if we could workshop some ideas and then present them to council before you all start working, workshopping your ideas for the coming year. Then you might ask for knobs of the head around the table because I'm only one person. But I, I'm encouraged to hear that though, and I think that would actually <coughs> that would be very useful for us as we as we start to feel the push and pull of development in the town. Is your retreat scheduled yet? Is there a scheduled date in January? Uh, we'll announce it real soon. For sure. All the way Tuesday night. <clears throat> oh, you mean our, 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 you're talking about our retreat, our annual retreat. Oh, we'll, hopefully we'll tell, sorry, hopefully, I throw a wrench into it, we're going to make an absolute decision Tuesday night. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
we reduce what we call the infiltration into our plant uh, when it rains, and, and that's a significant factor. Um, and uh, it's kind of ironic, our per capita water use has, has been going down, and if you look at those charts I bring you periodically, you're, you'll see that the water is kind of going down just a little bit per capita, but the wastewater is going up. So that means you're, we're capturing more, more wastewater than we did before. Uh, we looked at, uh, and Gene will get into some of the specifics, uh, uh, putting a, a, a package plant at the existing site. Um, the concern that we had is based upon our current flow rates, um, a package plant maximum we could put down at the existing plant site would be about 200,000 gallon uh, expansion. And again, based upon current flows, it would give us about eight years before we'd be back into the same situation uh, planning and designing another plant. And um, from a financial perspective, that just didn't seem to make sense to be a successive process of constantly issuing bonds. And so we looked back at the site that was bought back in 2000, I think, Doc, and probably no better. I think uh, the city back around 2000 purchased about 26, 27 acres on the uh, west side of town. Um, I actually uh, had plans designed for, uh, was it half a million or a million gallons? One million gallons. Um, and began looking at splitting up and putting the plant um, on the west side and capturing all the wastewater from the west, west side and processing it through the new plant and then the east side would be handled by the existing plant. Now, long term, because of the amount of property that was brought, at some point, all the wastewater from the city will probably end up going to the plant on the west side. Um, and you've heard talk about tonight, uh, West Bastrop Village, uh, that was uh, a municipal utility district Council approved 2002-2003, and for the last several years, uh, that project has remained dormant, and they have now resurrected that property, are in the process of submitting preliminary plans, um, securing home builders uh, to commence uh, construction, hopefully by towards the latter part of 2016. And when we took into account the, the full build-out of, of that facility, um, we, we felt the need to relook at what size plant um, we needed to construct to accommodate that. And of course, as we'll get into later here tonight, um, their pro rata share of uh, the cost of facilities needed uh, to service uh, their project. And so that's kind of a, a brief introduction. And from that, Gene has been looking at the, all the areas to the west, potential land uses, potential development, and what we need to look at. And with that, Gene, I'll turn it over to you. talk about wastewater first. Thank you, Council, for allowing me to come and talk to you again. Um, as Mike indicated several months ago, we were authorized to do a wastewater study for the city of Bashaw on the west end of the river, north side of the river. What you see up here was first charted as a 
is the wastewater CCN for the city of Bastrop. Uh, it's quite large. Uh, I'll give you some perspective. Is it working? No. Hello? Is the truck on the same place? Does it come on? There it is. Is that what the same place is? To give you some perspective of where we're at, I'm sorry, I'm hiding. Gary, my phone here. Here's Highway 71. Tahitian Village Drive would be right here. So we go towards Smithville some distance. This is Highway 95, projecting up through here. So we go up near, uh, within a mile or so of Exodus Ranch. Going, and then here's the river. Going on 71 towards the west. We go, this is FM 20, and 21 would be right here. So it's a quite extensive CCN. And once again, the CCN acronym is Certificate of Convenience and Necessity. We fought uh, at, at great odds with the city, of, with the LCRA and also um, uh, Aqua to receive this area about 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, so we're, through TCQ, we're, we're allowed to be the service provider of wastewater in this area. So TCQ is our provider or our, our regulator for wastewater uh, for the city of Bastrop and other cities. So as Mike has indicated, we're looking to the area to the west of the river. We got another microphone back there. We're looking to the area west of the river. So once again, this is the river. And, and we have identified. So we have identified each parcel of land within that CCN area west of the river and have associated it with a demand as far as wastewater by zoning. The rain indicates commercial areas along the major roadways. The green is just residential areas. And to give you some perspective of where we're at, Bastrop Village, or West Bastrop Village is right here. East Bastrop Village is on the east side of 20, and Hunter's Crossing is right here. As Mike indicated, we, uh, the city of Bastrop has two wastewater treatment plants, and they have a combined capacity of 1.4 million gallons per day. 75% uh, of it is a little bit over a million, it's 1.1 million, 50,000 gallons per day. And right now, for the months, and I'll make sure I didn't misread this, uh, the month of September, we were at 878, 878,000 gallons a day. Uh, October at 963,000 gallons a day. In November, we were at 945,000 gallons a day. Keep in mind that, we, that this does have wet weather in it, so we do have some fine eye associated with this. <coughs> also, I'd like to point out to you that about 50% of the flow will presently come from the west side of the river. <coughs> In addition to that, for you to understand, the Haitian Village, which is Bastrop County WCID number two, is contracted with the city for 200,000 gallons per day. And right now, that's about 85,000 gallons a day. So we do have a contract for part of our ultimate wastewater capacity. The uh, as I indicated, West Bastrop Village has been talking to us. And uh, is this where you want to give out the, the points? Well, let me, uh, yeah, let me say, say I think they come into it, and then I'll start walking through this. I think I'm going to get by. Um, 
I'm going to hand you a draft here, what I call uh, deal points. And I think what's important for the council to keep in mind, if Bastrop West, West Bastrop Village was not in place or was not coming on, we would be looking at building a plant about the size of one million gallons. But with them coming on and the impact that they'll have over the next 10 to 12 years, we're going to be looking at about a 1.5 million gallon plant. And that changes your costs significantly. So, and I want to say for the record, I don't believe the developers here, uh, but um, they have not opined on these deal points and uh, they wanted me to make sure uh, that the council understood that they have just received those uh, this afternoon. <clears throat> and as noted at the top, this is our, our, our first blush at trying to come up with um, uh, a, what we will call a wholesale wastewater agreement. Uh, when the city approved the creation of West Bastrop Village as a municipal utility district as part of that approval process was that they were to enter into a wholesale wastewater agreement. That was part of the uh, precedent uh, that was required for being approved. Now, uh, state law does allow them the opportunity to decertify and if they chose to decertify, when I mean by decertify, they would be decertifying out of our CCN, then they would have to come up with their own wastewater system. And um, I'm not saying that's not possible, but um, from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality standpoint, uh, their preference is that we look for regional systems and not individual systems just kind of scattered all over. So what we have at least uh, kind of put together here is the first bullet point. Uh, the city of Bastrop will uh, West Bastrop Village an initial point of connection for the West Bastrop Village wastewater transmission main to obtain temporary and interim wastewater service, initial interim service, from the city's existing wastewater system by constructing the necessary infrastructure to connect at the southwest corner of Hunter's Crossing subdivision, as illustrated in Exhibit A. Jeannie, you want to show where that connection point is? And, it, and there's a map in the back back there that shows you as well. Um, Bullet point number two, um, this is predicated upon what they have projected um, their build-out schedule to be. So this is based upon their schedule, not ours. The total capacity and or the number of LUVs for the initial interim service that WBD will be allowed to connect and deliver wastewater produced by the WBV mud at the connection point at the southwest corner of Hunter's Crossing subdivision will be as follows. Year 1, 36. Year 2, 36. Year 3, 36. Year 4, 36. And year 5, 36. The maximum total LUEs for temporary service is set at 180 LUEs. Um, during this interim phase uh, of wastewater treatment, each month during the first five years, West Bastrop Village shall pay an initial interim, uh, wastewater treatment charge, which payment will cover, for example, the city's expenses for operation and maintenance, administration, and wastewater treatment costs attributed to the wastewater treatment service provided to the city by WBV 
For example, the initial rate, which is is subject to, uh, per the city code, will be the rate will equal the number of connections platted in, uh, in the mud times the city's standard residential customer rate times 1.2 factor. Now, the, in, the, the in-city customers do not subsidize out of corporate limit customer service. Each LUE in the WBD mud will equate to a three-quarter inch meter, which will be calculated to equal the flow of 250 gallons per day, and no metering of the wastewater flows will be done. Now, we didn't pull that 250 gallons uh, out of the sky. Uh, that was based upon uh, the extensive analysis um, that Gene did during his analysis of our flow rates, and on average, that's what a household Three quarter inch meter will deliver into the sewer system. Connection to the city's wastewater system at the southwest corner of Hunter's Crossing will be at the cost of the developer. The city will build uh, West Pass Drive Village Mud directly for the initial service. Billing for LUE shall begin 90 days after each final plat is reported by the city. Why are we saying that? Well, we're not providing the water. We don't know when they're going to be doing the connections. And rather than be struck with the administration of trying to keep track, we're just saying once it's platted after 90 days, we're going to start charging you service now. I recognize this is the first uh, proposal, but uh, we're trying to keep the administration part from the city's perspective to a minimum. Regarding uh, wastewater rates, in effect, at that time, flat and adjusted annually or otherwise as stated in the code. Any future commercial users in West Island Pass Village will be billed per AWA LUE conversion standard. What we mean there is that a portion of the mud has an area for commercial development. That commercial development may call, everybody likes this interesting subject, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, I sure do. I'm getting the complex here now. Mike, I want to take a moment. Yeah, regarding your building up. living unit equivalent and, and it's based upon your meter size and the reason that we're saying a commercial uh, will be converted because the bigger the meter the bigger the impact the more water being used the more water that's going to be delivered into the wastewater system and the American Water Works Association has a universally accepted standard chart so there's no dispute this is we're trying to keep uh, national standards as how we apply this. Okay. Um, this is what we're presently estimating the time for constructing and permitting of the West Wastewater Treatment Plant. This is an estimated time for the city's construction of the new wastewater treatment plant. Estimate only. Should the timeline vary for any reason, then the initial interim service phase of service may be extended beyond the time period noted above to meet the service needs of WBB mud at the city's sole discretion and option. This hard to predict out beyond five years. Um, October 2015, uh, that day has passed and we were awaiting and we did receive a determination from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality 
as to which regulations GCEQ will require the city to use to construct a new wastewater treatment plant. If you recall, I mentioned earlier that the city had previously designed the plant but never built it. We did get a permit for it. And what GCEQ ruled was if we built the one million gallon plant, we would build under the new regulation, old regulations, but if we build under, if we build a 1.5, we're going to be subject to the new regulations, which is going to add additional cost to the construction of the plant. And we have received that, that instructions, uh, that that was a key for us being able to put the rest of this together. Um, we're commencing a rate and impact uh, study. Um, our impact fees are going to be altered significantly, as well as our, our rate structure. And extensive discussions um, with our financial advisor, what is envisioned here, you'll see gaps of time to allow some stair-stepping so as to gradually adjust our rates accordingly uh, so that we don't do have a sticker shock. Um, December, uh, the city to identify and finalize the wastewater collection mains and routes uh, from the mud to the new west wastewater treatment plant. And you'll, we'll show those in a minute. December 2015, we will begin working to obtain uh, easements uh, of wastewater lines from West Pass Drop Village Mud to the wastewater treatment plant. That's to give us an idea uh, where we may see some problems. Uh, some people may be very um, welcome to have wastewater available and not have to worry about uh, a septic tank. Um, and uh, it's been my experience in many cases, uh, that's a, a welcome and people are very welcome to give you an, an easement in exchange for a connection. Uh, January 1, the city will begin to do final design work on the West Bass Drop number three plant to provide the capacity for 1,200 LEDs for West Bass Drop mud as fully constructed, as well as the needs of the city, of course. On or before January 15th, this is very important because we really struggled with this, because if we start a design for a 1.5 million gallon plant, and we get all the way down to the bidding, and they decide they want to pull out, that means we built an oversized plant and will not have flow sufficient to, uh, for that plant to operate. So that would force us to have to go back and redesign back to a million gallon plant. And that could be putting, pushing us up against those percentages that I said, putting us in jeopardy of being in violation. Yes. So I thought it was very important up front. You're either going to commit or you're not going to commit because we don't have the luxury of going and or bearing the expense of designing a 1.5 million gallon plant, getting up to the point to bidding it, and they say, well, we're going to decertify and put a package plant on. We think we can do it cheaper. That's going to be a big expense to the city. My, my question was, if that does happen, uh, you mentioned earlier about the uh, $1.5 million cost versus the $1 million cost, and we have the old cost. Would we go back to the old cost, or is this a whole new ball game? We would go back to the one, we would redo, we would, we would back to the $1 million gallon plant, because based upon the work that Gene has done, our demands, if, as I stated earlier, but for Bastrop, what the West Bastrop Village, we would only, the city only need a one million gallon plant to handle the increased flows that we're seeing from the West and the growth of the West. Under the cheaper per permitting process. Under the cheaper permitting process. Yes, okay. So the developer will, uh, on or before January 15th, and these times are, uh, put this together here, there's a little slippage, but not a lot. Uh, the developer will require proposed acceptable 
acceptable financial assurance in an amount shown by an engineering estimate to cover the developer's pro rata share of the development cost of the wastewater treatment plant and related infrastructure cost, which will be utilized by the city in the event that the developer does not proceed with the project. The city and the developer will true up the estimated versus the actual uh, during the project, and if as a result of the plant true up, the cost will less, they'll get some back, uh, but failure to post fiscal assurance uh, will result uh, uh, and we'll get into that more, the penalties. So in essence, what we're saying is, if we get up that 1.5 million and they back out, we're gonna call on that financial performance to cover the cost we've incurred for designing 1.5, plus the cost of having to go back and downsize and any other costs we may have incurred because we've gone this far out and now we're having to backtrack. To back up a little bit, the reason, the reason this is, uh, uh, is uh, a little complicated it's because they're mud. Right. If they weren't mud, we, we wouldn't have to be, we wouldn't have any options at all. Right. That. In fact, that's right. And that's why I'm saying we're going to be redoing our impact fees because if you were inside the city limits and you were connecting, you would be paying an impact fee, which they're not paying an impact fee. They're paying a pro rata share for, for their reserve capacity that's related to their development. So when will they receive these deal points? I know we they got them this afternoon. Oh, they got them this afternoon. Also. Okay. There's been not too many uh, nights. I've had too much sleep in the last three weeks. This has been a very worrisome project because of the financial exposure that we're. I'm making sure. I'm, 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 the most important thing to me is I know we've got to build a new wastewater plant. I just don't want the city to be exposed to have them pull out. And 
as a result, rather than paying an upfront cost, they pay, that's when we get back into the living unit equivalents or the meter size, they would be paying an impact fee plus their normal wastewater rate. Um, because of the time frame, our, our goal is to try to get the plans and specifications uh, submitted. Um, to TCEQ by July of 2016. Um, TCEQ could take up to six months to approve plans and specifications. So we're projecting receiving final approval from the plans uh, in December. But we would wait at least five or six months before we go off the bid. These are these gaps that I'm talking about. Um, but on or before May 1st, uh, West Pass Route Village will provide any adjustments in posted financial assurance to cover any change in the engineering cost estimate, which must be in a form of amount acceptable to the city and the city's financial advisor for the MUDS rata share of the MUDS share of the new wastewater treatment plant number three and for the associated wastewater interceptors from the development to the west, uh, wastewater plant number three as per exhibits A and B. Failure to pay the finance or fiscal assurance will entitle the city to seek fiscal damages related to its reliance on MUD for participation in the project. This is the critical point. We're going off the bids and they pull out. And that's why I say there's going to be a penalty. And, and so I've pretty much gone over that with you. Uh, and at the same time, we will be in the bond issuance phase for paying for our portion. Uh, June, um, West Bastrop Village will be required to remit its pro rata share uh, to the city. These are your actual dollars. These are not bonds. Uh, these are not letters of credit. We're talking actual cash will be required to be deposited to the city prior to the council in July awarding the bid for the project. And it will be put in a, a separate segregated account so that as we draw down the payment, let's just say for points of discussion, 75% uh, is city and 25% is West Pass Drive Village. We will get, because of the length of the project, we'll get pay applications from the, the, the contractor. When we get those in, 75% will come from the city, 25% will come from the cash that we have in the escrow account of uh, West Pass Drive Village. Uh, it is anticipated about a year and a half to construct the new plant and um, uh, wait, uh, and, and collector mains. So after your award in July, it would be January of 2019 uh, before the construction would be completed. And it takes about three to four months once a plant is constructed to bring it into what we call an operational phase. Um, there are certain things that have to happen. Uh, we have to create certain bacteria growth to help treat the wastewater and such. And so. Uh, just because it's built doesn't mean the day that it's completed, it's automatically operational. It takes a few months. Uh, exhibit A, the construction point for the interface showing the preliminary route will be constructed uh, for the long-term connection to and the service from the wastewater plant with a prorated cost to be determined. Exhibit B is a preliminary route of the interceptors uh, along the boundary 304 and to the wastewater. <clears throat> After we've commenced and we've moved into the operation of the new plant, then we will enter into a long-term also wastewater uh, agreement uh, to Bastrop, West Bastrop Village. Uh, the following facilities must be designed and constructed in order to install uh, the city of Bastrop to provide wholesale water service, wastewater service, excuse me, to West Pass Drop Village. A plus or minus one <coughs> MGD plant, and I'm just telling the location, and that's shown on your exhibit. Two, um, there are still some factors we're dealing with, but a minimum of a certain 
size wastewater collector main commencing at the point where the collector main is constructed from the wastewater treatment plant property line extending so many feet east to the eastern boundary of State Highway 304 shown on, as point A on Exhibit B running to the western side of State 304 to point B as shown on Exhibit B a minimum of a size line will be determined uh, running from the wastewater collector main at point B on the western side, running along northern along Highway 304 to point C as shown on exhibit B. Then a minimum of a certain size wastewater collector main commencing at point C on the western side of State 304, running westerly, ending at the point of connection to West Pass Drop Village Collector identified as point E as shown on exhibit A. Bastrop shall design and construct cost to be designed, uh, wastewater plant and related wastewater collection infrastructure noted above. Best, Bastrop shall use best reasonable efforts to initiate and complete construction. And uh, we still have got to plug in the months for this. And to have this engineer review the plans. They'll be given 15 business days to review the plans. I'm just going to cap some of these. The total amount of West Bastrop Village to complete the plant, we're going to give them the engineer's cost estimate, but at the project bid, they're going to have to true it up. Bastrop will hold the project amount in what I told you earlier, a segregated account. Honor before five days prior to the council going out for bids, um, that we will provide them written notification of the proposed release of bid packets and the updated engineering cost. Within five days prior to the city's proposed date for the council's award of the bid, uh, West Pass Rock shall remit to the city its pro rata share because we'll know at that time what the cost will be. And if they don't, then again, there'll be struggle with penalty, but we won't be able to award the bid either. The parties agree and acknowledge that if the bids received for the project and the bid is awarded uh, by the city council the project is within 25 percent of the previously identified engineers cost construction cost estimate the project shall go forward the parties agree that they shall do a true up at the end of the project and if there's a reimbursement due back from them out of their segregated account it will be given back to them or if they owe us additional funds uh, they will have to pay the city Um, upon completion of constructing the wholesale wastewater facility and the time Bastrop has acted to finally accept the wholesale wastewater as a city facility, will operate and maintain the wholesale wastewater facilities. And upon completion of the wastewater facilities, Bastrop and West Pipe will meet to do a true up, as I said, and we'll provide them any overages. They will provide us any overages or if there's uh, uh, surplus left, we will return that back. Um, when the initial interim service ends, um, uh, West Pass will transition to the new wastewater plant. On or before the first of each month, the service city will provide the city with the number of active resident connections and the number of active commercial account, uh, commercial education and other connections, and the estimated number coming on connection. We're not going to change it, but at least it gives us an idea of what their growth rate is doing. Each month, the city, West Pass the city will build. West Pass Drop Bill is directly based upon rate as follows, which was the same rate, number of connections flatted, and the standard rate plus 1.2. That's to cover our overhead administration. We're calling for a 20 year agreement, and since they're paying their pro rata share up front, uh, they of course would not be subject to uh, impact fees because they'll be, they will be the retail provider with inside the mud. The city will agree to attempt to negotiate with other developers who might benefit for oversizing to see if they wish to participate. Exhibit B uh, is, shows you the location of uh, where the, the site the city bought back in 2000. But, and keep in mind, the size of these lines will change. For example, uh, the city may determine the line coming out of the wastewater plant up to point A 
should be larger than when we cross over because eventually there may be wastewater coming down this way from other development that we would have pick up or development over here. There could be a line going somewhere else. And then from B to C will be another side of the line, and then from C <laughs> on the next page you'll see on C is where it turns and goes westwardly, and D is the red line is the interim connection, and then the D point is where it becomes a permanent connection. What's the street here? That is out of Crossing, and that's Outfitter. Uh, where the other one's at? Yeah. No, that's, that's Granger. Granger. That's Granger. That's good. Oh, okay. Yeah. The city will own that. Okay. Yes. So, that's a lot of information in a, in a short period of time. I, I can tell you it took a little longer than that to put it together. But um, they are they are really wanting to have their houses um, on the ground starting in December of 2016. So they are really putting the pressure on me to come up with something, and I realize I'm not. I, it'll be on my city manager's report uh, Tuesday night to solicit input back from you. Uh, I don't. I know I hit you with a lot of information. I would encourage you to give me a call. Um, I did look at several other cities who have entered into uh, wholesale wastewater agreements. Um, everyone charge more to a mud as an outside customer versus inside so that 1.2 factor is not something that should come as alarm to them um, being treated as a wholesale customer has its own impact paying its upfront costs uh, we're, we're not here to subsidize their growth but if uh, let me test the council and you i know you're going to put this on your city Manager's report. Why don't we post it as an agenda item, and then if you get some kind of, I'm just thinking about the urgency of this thing and your your, your January deadline. If they happen to agree or have a little tweak or something, uh, and the council feels confident to make a decision that night, fine. And if not, we're no worse off. Uh, so, I mean, does that make sense, Scott? Kind of, Nods around the table. I mean, or should, should we just? How long uh, do they have to respond to what they receive this afternoon? I'm going to give them a couple of weeks. I mean, I, I mean, these can slot about a month or two, but not much more than that. I mean, we're going to be postured having to make a decision in January. I mean, or we're not. We, we won't be able to because the the unknown factor here is is if we get an accelerated growth inside the city on the west side. That's going to impact the LUEs that will be available if we run into some problems, like with TCEQ, they want this or that, and so it's a nine-month process instead of a six-month process. We may not have the availability to give them any more LUEs because of development that hit the city. So we're, we're balancing a lot of balls here to try to keep it moving, but at the same time reach, uh, accommodate their time frame so that they can get their project off and running. And at the end of the day, the whole financial exposure will like the rest of the city. Yeah, and given your answer to Kelly's question, maybe it's better just wait till January. But well, I, I, I would like to love starting getting feedback. I mean, yeah, but, but I'm saying if to, make, to be able to make a decision, we can give you feedback either way. But I, I'm not expecting a decision by Tuesday night, no way. You don't think that, okay, forget it. We'll do it under your, forget my idea. The other question is, we, uh, just want to make it clear, this is a business that we run. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it's a monopoly. And we're just going to have to charge whatever we have to charge to get people's sewer treated down the river. So it's not like we're going to be raising taxes or anything. We're going to have to make this work. And we talk about sticker shock, but sticker shock is, you know, the worst sticker shock is I can't get a car at all at any price and right. we don't have that option here. We've got to provide sewer services. And that's why 
you, if you start studying those time frames and recognize that the plant will not become operational until sometime 2019, that gives us about three, three and a half years to do some graduated adjustments in our rates while this is all going on because we can stagger the issuance of our bonds to, to accommodate our construction schedule and maintain the financial integrity of our wastewater fund because we're considered an enterprise fund and the mayor's absolutely correct, we should run like a business. And, and thirdly, because we run like a business, they should pay their fair share and we shouldn't be subsidizing their development. But well, the graduate thing sounds great. Can I say three great. things real quick? One thing is that this is all been based out of the year of the The man report that y'all paid for several months ago. CHMC Hill. And according to that report, we're going to be hitting 75% of the existing plant 2018. That's the first point. The second point I was going to make is that the property that y'all bought 10 or 12, 15 years ago is allocated for six to eight million gallons of treatment. So we're going to, it's a big site for a lot of water. So the trucks that are going to come up through the port are going to be big. And we're not building up, we're not planning those pipes for. 1.5 million. G makes a good point. We're, we're planning on those pipes because it's not the cost of the it's not the cost of the pipe that's driving the cost. It's the cost of the, the digging it. And some of those lines are going to be as much as 18 to 20 foot deep. So we want to make sure that we properly oversize it to accommodate future growth. So we're not out there paralleling a pipe 18 foot because that's going to be expensive another 10 years down the road. So, so someday. Some city manager and mayor come in to see you and me at the nursing home and say, hey, thanks for putting in those big old pipes. That's right. Okay. And the last point was, um, the last thing I was going to say is if we pull the water from the lake's west side off of the existing plant, by those projections, that's subject to change. The this existing plant, right? Right? if we pull everything off west of the river to oh. the new plant, okay. this plant should last to 2000. Bonds and set some money aside for this. How much? A hundred thousand dollars to set aside for the work that Gene's been doing. Oh, okay. Just not for this. Not for this. Just for this. Just okay. to give us the, the types, the capacity, and sizing, and flows, and things that we to give us the data to base this on. And that's, and, and that's why I'm saying, based upon the work that Gene has been doing over the last several months, we, we know that to meet our growth, based upon the CH2M Hill study. And what we're seeing happening at the wastewater plant, a one million gallon plant will meet our needs for the next 15 years for sure. So, thank you, for whatever reason, we're going to One million. Exactly. And then the other one I'd like to point out our permit for the one million west of the river uh, expires in fall of 2019. So, and they said that's the last time they're renewing it, so we don't build it. Right. It's long anyway. It's long. Anyway. And uh, if we're not operational, <laughs> We'll have to renew that permit before we, if we're not, out, if we're halfway through construction, then, and we're not operational, we're going to be in a permit renewal under new regulations. So there's a, a lot of factors driving this. So do, do we have some, a little bit of fudge time to make sure we get that deadline? As long as we stay pretty much on the schedule. But we better stop better put red down somewhere. That's right. I, I was going to say, you know, sometime, I think uh, Kane and I were the only ones on the council President the council, but, you know, we talked about going and building that was a $10 million project or something at one point, and we got really just, it just seemed like overwhelming, but I mean, you have come along, correct, we've got, been talking about this ever since, uh, you've been talking to us about this this year, and it's, it, you've kind of raised the, the, the level of the pot, so we're not falling to death, you know, I think we're adjusting to it. it sounds like, to me at least, the timing is good, uh, you've got you've laid out something that's going to work, and we're really making some progress for this for this community. And I, I think the timing is. Uh, it, you know, I, I never dreamed a few years ago, okay, that we would be feeling quite this comfortable when we got to it. I feel pretty good at this point. So. Well, I'll tell you one thing that we did change is is early on we we just said the.
package plan that we discussed five or six years ago is not cost effective because for some reason the cost of package plan over that time frame has increased substantially and a projected cost of a 400,000 gallon uh, package plant is over $2 million. And that doesn't buy us much time. It doesn't buy much time at all. And we're right back into the financial markets. And that's what starts affecting your bond rating when you're constantly running back to the financial market because it, it doesn't demonstrate that you're, you're planning or, or thinking ahead of what your needs are and setting your rates accordingly. Well, I hope that uh, everybody involved down the road has that 2019 date, whatever it is, to ECQ. I don't want way, to way big on their calendars. I'm going to ask one more question. Yep. Um, Mike, what, what action are you going to want from us first? Well, I want to hear back from them, and then um, at first meeting in January, um, we're going to have to start, I mean, contact me individually or email me your thoughts. I want to incorporate them in there. But either by the first or second council meeting in January, we're going to have to come at least to, we can't write a contract in, in a 45-day time frame. So we're going to have to basically turn this deal point into a letter of understanding. And we're going to need to be posture to do that by at least the second council meeting in January if we're going to stay pretty much on the schedule. We start moving into February and March, then we're going to be pushing things out. So you're going to need us to contract you, what I'm asking would be to approve a letter of understanding, which this would be converted into taking this and turning it into a letter of understanding, which will be the basis on which we'll write the contract, which will take about three or four months. But that will give the trigger that the parties understand what they're getting into, what's required of them. I mean, it needs, it needs some brushing and, and tuning up, but this is beginning to, I had to formulate something and this is the, the at least the footprint for what we're looking at, conceptually how we're approaching this. Uh, but now we've got to fine tune it, and once you sign it, then we're going to be moving forward. Now we do have money, both through our impact fees and through a settlement I did with Four Star, to cover some of our costs, like to get Gene started and design the plan before we have to issue bonds, because I want to get our rate study done and things of that nature. So we, you're, you're about to say, Mike, you're recommending we spend X dollars for engineering. Where's that money coming from? Well, we've been collecting impact fees, and we were in a, a very kind of awkward agreement with Four Star, and I got about a $700,000 settlement payment that has been put back and not touched. And so uh, we, uh, we at least have the money to commence covering the engineering and design and the any legal or other services <coughs> that may be required. It's not cheap to design plants and pipes. I mean, the, the plants are, are pretty, and it's really the more detailed you <coughs> the plant, the more the easier you'll get through TCQ. I think we're going to ready. I hear to adjourn the workshop session or reconvene an open session. And um, is there any action that we need to take? Well, how bad did I shock you? Uh, with the seven minutes. I said, how bad did I shock you all? With, with going seven minutes. <laughs> oh, with this, this, this one here. I think we've been, you've been, you've been raising the temperature a little bit as we go along. Okay. Uh, I think. Uh, we don't have any action. Uh, anybody got anything?